We're up to page Haftes, uh, and we're up to the uh, 13th and final of the Midos. That'll conclude the first chapter of the book. Then um, there is a second chapter of the book, which goes into um, a kind of a more general description of kind of serving Hashem through the teachings of, or actually an introduction to, the serving of Hashem through the teachings of the Sphiros. That's the topic of, uh, of, of the second parak, And then the remaining prakim um, go through, chapter by chapter, each of the spheros and how we specifically use each sphero for increasing our Avodah Hashem. So, like I said, that's basically how the, the book is, um, is, is divided. The first part being serving Hashem through a deeper understanding of the Yud Gimel Midos of Rachamim, which um, we'll be concluding today, Bezad Hashem. And then the second part of the book, after this introduction to the spheros, we'll be going into chapter by chapter, serving Hashem at a deeper level through the actual, the spheros themselves. So uh, let's try and finish off then, the 13th and the final of the Midos, on page Chavtes. Hare Midos sheyesh le Kadosh Baruch im Yisrael. Excuse me, this 13th Midos, mi me kedem. Mi me kedem, from days of old. This is an attribute that God interacts with the Jewish people. When the merit of the forefathers has been depleted, continuing the discussion that we had from yesterday, what can possibly be done when you have people whose transgressions are such that they have no redeeming value of their own? And they can't call upon the schus avos, the merit of forefathers either, because that's been depleted. And there's a problem even calling upon the bris avos, because these people have taken themselves out of the bris. They're acting in a way which is no longer like being part of the covenant of the people. Even worse than the category that we were discussing yesterday, where towards the end of the class we were talking about how in general, he was talking about people who are transgressing and steeped in sin, but it's more out of an inability to control their desires than it is about heretical beliefs. Uh, but there's a whole other category of people who are transgressing not because they can't exercise self-control, but because ideologically they're so far removed from the Jewish people that they just don't believe, and they don't care, and they wantonly transgress. That's a, different, that's a totally different category of people. These people, as far as their own rights are concerned, they have no, no real redeeming, inherently redeeming factors, value. It says, it's written, in the prophet Yermia, I will remember for you, God says, speaking to the transgressing Jewish people, I will remember for you the kindness that you showed me in your youth, the love that you expressed as a betrothed, and the fact that you came after me, after God, into a wilderness which was barren and unplanted. You, the Jewish people, in great faith and trust, agreed to depart from Egypt and follow me into the wilderness, despite the fact that at those times the Jews had already been lightened of their burden and they were showered on with gifts and with favor of the Egyptians. They were elevated um, um, beyond all imagination in honor and glory by their former captors and uh, taskmasters. And uh, nevertheless, they were willing to leave all of that luxury and all of that wealth and all of that honor and all of that glory which they attained at that point in America, I mean, in Egypt, in order to leave the flesh pots of Egypt and follow God into a barren, desolate land with hardships and the threat of war and uh, uh, all other different types of trials and tribulations. God says, I remember that you left the uh, flesh pots in the land to the west of Israel and came into the wilderness after me. Mamish Zohar, Kadosh Baruch Hu, Yemei Kadmonim, 
which means that God remembers the day of the earliest of our ancestors. Even though any particular individual Jew might have strayed entirely off the path, but in such a case, God will remember not just the merit of the forefathers because it's been depleted, and not just the covenant of the forefathers because this person abrogates the covenant, but he actually remembers, recalls how this person is part of a people who left everything in order to irrationally fly into the hands of their new lover, that's God, and trusted in his faith. And in the merit of this person being a part of that people, God remembers and has favor over this person as well. Ava shahaya mikodem, the love that existed very early on. Umerachem al Israel, and as a result of this, God has favor over the entire Jewish people, even over this impure remnant, all on account of this kind of blind love and faith that the Jewish people expressed towards God from the inception of the Jewish people. And regarding this, God will recall all of the mitzvahs that the Jewish people have done from the time that the Jewish people was born. And all of the good attributes and all of the quality, qualities and all of the good character traits with which God has guided His world. God makes a special consideration, a segula, in order to have mercy over even these very far removed Jews, wantonly wicked, Nevertheless, he shows favor and bestows love and kindness upon them on account of our ancestors who showed an irrational love for God. So just like our early ancestors exhibited this irrational, illogical love and desire to enter within the, the, the embrace of God, so, as it were, God irrationally, illogically, accepts their descendants and embraces them despite their transgression. Mida keneged mida. Commensurate. Commensurate to what the founders of the people did, God does for their descendants. Was it really so irrational for them to, to love God? Like, it makes sense he did all these miracles for them. Why wouldn't it? It would seem irrational for them not to. I mean, they weren't escaping like a lush, a lush lifestyle. They were escaping two hundred and ten years of like abhorrent slavery. So, therefore, you're strengthening his question. You mean, yeah. or answering? Yeah, it? well, the, the strengthening his question because the the way uh, you put it was that they were leaving like these their luxurious lives in Egypt to go and to follow blindly into the. But that's not at all the case. They're rescued from from a uh, terrible slavery. That's the way it was initially, but I'm saying during the last period of their their sojourn in Mitzrayim, like they were... The plagues or whatever? What's that? After the plagues have been completed. Okay. Yeah. But didn't they go immediately after the plagues? Like, was that? Like literally the, the day after the plague. Well, there was a plague of the firstborn. I, there was, it's true that there was a plague of the, the, plague of the, the plague of the firstborn, and they did leave right after that. But the period you know, before that, they were living in luxury. In other words... In Egypt? Yeah. As slaves? No. They were freed. For how long was that period? Six months. Mm-hmm. They, were, they were freed by Pharaoh for six months? Yes. Just there was, out in Egypt? Yeah. There was a long time, actually, between each plague. So then why, was, why did Pharaoh not want to let go of the people that he freed? What, what does he care if he freed them already? They're no longer the slaves. Well, they were also contributing to the economy, and they were an important part of the... Okay. Yeah. Wow. But uh, he also had in mind, uh, you know, God, God actually hardened, at that point, God, you know, God hardened his heart. So that it was vacillating. After each plague, there was actually a period of great respite. Yeah, which was in the longest, the longest of which was before the last of the plagues. And um, and um, the Jews could have stayed in Egypt after the plague of the firstborn, because uh, the place had been totally decimated, and they had very you know every reason to say, "Wow, the plague is over. The, you know, every every the whole you know the place is in ruins. All of the firstborns had been slayed." The only firstborn in the whole country that's left is Pharaoh himself. And he's been bowed. And he's been humbled. And they could have stayed. And they had it very good there. So is that why 80% st- stayed and 20% left? Well, 80, 80% stayed, but on, on four feet under, as they say. 
Meaning what? That they died. Six feet under? Yeah. Is it six foot under? Did I say four feet under? Yeah. Four amas. Six they died because they were Egyptians killed them. No, because they, they died in the play in the plague of um, in, the, in the plague of of Hoshech, of darkness. Because these are people who did not want to leave and they did not want to be part of. But, so but that was beforehand. Yes, that was beforehand. So they died in the plague of darkness. Yeah. Because they were not going to leave had they lived. Yes. Yeah, but that's a different. Yeah, that's a different story though. But wow. still, nevertheless, it would seem that it's still a very logical thing to believe in God. Well, why do you say 80%? That's, that's just a number that's been thrown around. Yeah, a fifth. A fifth departed. That means a fifth is 20%, which 80% yeah. stayed behind. Right, yeah. 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 But it still seemed logical that they would believe in God. That it so, so again, I mean, it's not necessarily logical because, you know, what you're saying is after all these miracles, then they should have, con you know, it could be more easily expected that they rely on more miracles. But relying on miracles is not logical. Splitting, but they relied on the splitting of the Red Sea. They, how so? Well, they came up to the Red Sea and until they were neck deep in the water, uh, it didn't split. And so, then there was an army chasing them. Yeah. yeah we, so th there is a reliance on a miracle. No, because they, so they would have drowned in the sea. But they didn't. They didn't approach the sea, right? <laughs> thinking that they would it would split. In fact, the Jewish people didn't know where to go. They didn't know to go backward or forward or right or right or left. And it's not like they jumped in. One person, Nachshon ben Amirav, right, jumped in, and it only split after, like you said, it became neck deep. But the rest of the people didn't rely on a miracle that it would split. On the contrary, they cried out to God, we don't know what to do. We can't go backwards because of the Egyptians. We can't go forward because of the, the sea. We can't go right or left because God had uh, determined they were wild animals, barring them in on both sides. So they had nowhere to go. They couldn't go backwards. They couldn't go forwards. They couldn't go right or left. The only way, you know, there's only two directions left. Right? Down or up. So they went up. And they raised their hands to Hashem and said, Hashem, save us. God said that to Moshe. What are you crying out to me for? What are you making a big deal? Go, go forward. He said, we can't go forward. There's water here. I can't go. So Nachshon says, God says, forward, we go forward. And he jumped. And then the split sea, the, excuse me, the sea split. And people started going through. So it's true that uh, they had seen miracles, but still, you know, um, um, it, you know, Relying on a miracle, I don't think, is like rational behavior. But believing in him would be rational. Yeah, well, that's true. I guess that's true. But why would they leave? You know, in other words, the, you know, the, the, it speaks in their favor that they left. Uh, they left Egypt despite all the comforts they had and all and every reason to think that the that the that the um, that the uh, the threat was over. After the decimation, after the decimation of the of the firstborn, that would almost be more relying on a miracle than to stay. Yeah. You mean to stay? Yeah. <laughs> but here you had millions of people, men, women, and many children going into an uninhabited, uh, unarable, you know, land with no water. And what, what, how would they be sustained? Mm -hmm. Going out into the like into a wilderness, into a no man's land. We got you this far, you know. So that's relying on a very large, large miracle. So, you know, God had a good track record, it's true. Yeah? But Stain would have, technically, I mean, to me, it would seem Stain would be relying on a miracle as well. You're gonna, he's going to continue to protect you while you're in this land of people who, like... You know, yeah, possibly, like, possibly. But uh, I could say that... Um, seems less logical. You know, he, he, here they were, you know, plague after plague after plague, having their position improved and elevated time and time again. Um, so they might well have, um, you know, been presented with the possibility of relying on the miracle and staying. Like, why leave? Everything's going very well for us here. The plagues are we've been liberated. They're decimating the Egyptians, and time and time again, you know, God is upping the ante. And at this final point, everybody's been decimated. All these first, so that's it. He's like. Ding dong, the witch is dead, the witch is dead, the witch is dead. Ding dong, the wicked witch is dead, let them just stay. Yeah? Um, which I think, uh, even, even if there would be a degree of relying on the miracle there, um, when you've got everybody in place and all of their needs taken care of right there, to go uprooting everybody into this wilderness, not knowing what's going to happen with you. <coughs> That's what it says here. Zacharti la chesed noreich. Avas kilosaich, lech dech achrai, beretz dozeruah. 
like a young bride who follows her groom through thick and thin into the, uh, you know, into the world without necessarily any, any guarantee of security or success, or, but because they're just, she's in love. She's in love with her, with her groom. So too, the Jewish people did with God. And uh, therefore, uh, because of that kind of irrational, illogical, to a certain degree, uh, abandon uh, out of love for God, God, uh, with abandon, embraces the descendants of these people. The wicked. The harizei mida koleles kolamidos kulam. This, he says, is a mida mi mekedem, which includes all of the other midos that have been discussed until now. Kidepereshu be'idra, as it was explained in the idra, which is a certain part of the Zohar. I can't say that I can tell you offhand what, uh, what that means. I apologize. But um, there is an idea that Mime Kedem, from times of old, is a reference back to the sphere of Keser, where... Uh, Keser is where everything starts. It's where everything. It, it's that juncture within which everything unfolds. So that the sphere of Keser, as we said, receives from the divine illumination or light or radiation of energy from above it, and then filters it down into or refracts it down into the other spheros. Keser, Chokma, Bina, Das, Chesed, Gevurat, Tiferes, Nezachot, Yisod, Malchus. Right. All of that originates in in Keser. So there's a correlation between Mime Kedem from days of old and Keser. From an earlier stage in God's process of creation where he directed the divine energy through Keser in order to bring out all of the other spheros in which are expressed the Midos of Rachamim. And we saw early on, I think in the first Mida, right, that, uh, that the Yud Gimel Midos of Rachamim actually originate within Keser. Remember that? And therefore, I, I believe he's making reference here to things coming about, bound round, coming back full circle. That me me kedem is actually a reference to keser. And since these spheros are interlocked, like we've discussed in the past, you've got keser being filtered down into its different subcon- subcomponents of the spheros, finally is drained down and received by Malchus, where that Malchus then passes on to the Keser of the next world below it. So that there's like this type of a thing. Right? There's like this type of a thing. So that here he says that all of these Midos of Rachamim, which originate in the Keser of one world, right, ultimately bring one down to the Keser, or the Malchus, which is the Keser of the world, of the world below it. He says, Harize mida koleles kol midos kulam. And therefore, this mida of mi me kedem goes back and contains within it all of the others as well. Why? Because all of the yud gimel midos of Rachamim, which were reflected through the keser of one realm, is actually connected down into the malchus, which is the keser of the next realm. And therefore, things come full circle. Vakach. Therefore, he says, So too, a person should yisaken han hagaso im bnei adam, relating this down now to us and improving our daily living. So too, a person should act with other people. Shafidu yimtza ta'ano mi'elo haniskaros, even if he can't find any of the claims that have been expressed earlier, meaning he finds no redeeming point or factor for another, for another person at all, for, for whatever reason, Yomar, he should still say, There was a time when this person or this category of people didn't transgress. Whenever that was, right, they, didn't, they, they, they weren't born transgressing. Except for Amalek. What's that? Except for Amalek. Except for Amalek? Yeah. <laughs> right? We don't take into account for Amalek. That's an interesting point because <coughs> I, didn't, I didn't mention it yesterday and I said at the end of the class that there's so much to say. There are things I wanted to say which I didn't have time to. One of that was that these Midos apply even to non-Jews. And um, 
Asher Nishbat Lavoisenu, which is this Shavua that God made to our um, forefathers, uh, who in whose merit we talk, we spoke about like links of a chain reaching from the source of the blessing to its fulfillment, including every Jew along the way, right? That applies really not, not only to Jews, but every human being who Abraham and Isaac and Jacob received really the mission from Adam, and all human beings are therefore descendants of, of, of Adam. And the Torah of, of Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov was certainly applicable to non-Jews. We find that Avram himself was teaching non-Jews. And the Torah that was given to Moshe was given not only for the Jewish people, it was given to the Jewish people, but not only for the Jewish people, it was given for non-Jews as well. Which means that the God acts in, 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 with these attributes of Rachamim for non-Jews as well, not only Jews. It's true that here, after the Torah was given, things are you know, Jewishly specific, but it's not excluding non-Jews either. So, you know, except you know, we entertain ben, Ben's question which, or, or, or statement that, you know, what about Amalek? Amalek might be the only exception, right, that there's no redeeming value for and that Amalek has to be totally obliterated. And therefore there should be... No, what's that? Yeah, I was going to say. Therefore no mercy should be shown on Amalek. And we find, for example, that, uh, that Shaul the Melech was greatly criticized by, by Shmuel and Navi for having done just that, showed mercy upon Agag, keeping him alive. And as a result of that, one night that Agag remained alive longer than he should have, it, you know, it was already right, determined, it was, it was already orchestrated that uh, a woman should be brought into his prison chamber and, and she became pregnant from him. And the result of that was Haman and the proliferation of, the, of Amalek as well. It seems to indicate that there should be no mercy whatsoever on Amalek. There are exceptions, though. We find that uh, even, uh, even Amalek, Haman, had offspring who converted and became great Torah scholars. So you have to say that uh, an, a person who, even, even, even Amalek, if they repudiate their Amalekite, uh, can also be redeemed. But you don't give them the time to be Jew. Like if it's a baby, you kill him right away. You don't wait for him to, you don't do the rock move of, oh, maybe he could uh, do Jew, or maybe he could uh, renounce the baby, you kill the baby. Right? Yeah, is that true? Yeah. All men, women, and children. Yeah. So, you know, I think, yeah, you have to say that um, you know, Amalek, insofar as Amalek pits in its nature, pits itself diametrically opposed to God, then there's no you know, general redeeming kind of potential for Amalek, unless you know, through, through some course, you know, through some chain of events, a particular Amalek shows that he repudiates that, uh, that quality. It's true here, he doesn't say, so a person should act with, with, with every fellow Jew. He doesn't say that. So true, a person should act with every human being. Even if he doesn't find any claim, uh, to fa any claim in his favor, Yomar, he should still say, there was a time when these people did not transgress. At that time, or in days of old, in the early times, before this person became what he became, he was kosher. So since he was kosher, he was not wicked at that time, that itself is a way of, of, of finding some, some redeeming value and benefit for the person. And that would fit in with what he's saying here, the attribute of me me kedem. God shows mercy on a person, me me kedem. He shows mercy on Jews who are totally wicked because of the love that they expressed for God in times of old. And he says, therefore, we should also f show favor upon people who themselves were good in times of old. And he should recall to them, meaning for them, recall to himself on their account, the good things that they did when they were young.
in their youth. V'yizkor lehem avas gemulei mikholov atike mishidoim. And also he should recall for them the love of the gemulei mikholov. I suppose when they were young, when they were infants. Atike mishidoim from times of old when they were nursing from their mother's breast. And according to this outlook, you'll ne- you will not find a person. It's not that who, right, about which it would not be fitting to be benevolent to that person. Unless the words are connected here, meaning to be benevolent to him by praying for him. Al Shlomo regarding his peace, and to have mercy on him. So that every single person, because they had some good, pure beginning, has some point upon which you can actually pray for the benefit of this person and maybe even do something practically and pragmatically for the benefit of this person. It's a very hard attribute to consider fulfilling. In other words, if there's somebody who you know to be completely and utterly wicked through and through, with the most diabolical and heretical yeah, thoughts uh, and, and, and actions, even such a person you should think good about because there was a time before he w- became like this and he was just an innocent youth. And therefore you should think good about this person, pray for the person's welfare, and perhaps even do something for the person's welfare. That's very extreme. Very extreme. Maybe what he means is to do, good, to do good for him in order to pray for him that he should do tshuva. But as long as this person is like public enemy number one, he has to be treated accordingly and therefore you know, have to protect yourselves and others from this person's harm while simultaneously praying that the person do tshuva and come around to being uh, come, come around to, get, to regaining some of the at least to some some degree of the of the of the, of the innocence that he lost so entirely. Yeah, what were we gonna say? So, so the the way that we're taking like the days of old, like like Adam, like didn't tra- before Adam transgressed, <coughs> mm-hmm. it's kind of like us as babies, like before we. we transgressed. Yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't I, di- I didn't say that, and I didn't even think it, but I think it's a very good thought, and it's it's a, it's def- it would seem to be included in this. Yeah. Yeah. To remember the, the, the initial innocence, which would apply for um, uh, any particular human being who's become wicked but had innocent beginnings, or perhaps even the entire Jewish people, or a great part of the Jewish people who might be currently wicked but had very good beginnings either in their own personal lives or at the generation of the Exodus when they ran, when they ran after God, or Adam, like you're saying, you know, created initially pure and free of sin, and uh, even for non-Jews, and even for tyrants, and um, you know well, how this would fit in with, for example, Haman or Agag. You know uh, that's uh, that's a very good question because he says here that there's nobody. Lo yimtza adam. You'll not find a person. When you consider and you look at it in this light, that it's not it, it's not befitting to pray for this person's ben, behalf, pray, pray on this person on, on on behalf of this person. There's no such person, even Hitler, Yimakshimo, yeah, and all of these other very very wicked people from 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 from, from Amalek. Theoretically, they, they, what he's saying here would apply to them as well. That's pretty intense. How many of us can say that we'd be so graciously forgiving? Uh, of people who have only harmed us in the most slightest and insignificant ways. And we bear very intense, burning grudges against people for doing relatively small things against us because of our honor and our pride and everything like that. And still, we should be willing, if not to pragmatically and practically benefit this person where as long as he's evil, you could actually be enabling that person to, to perpetrate even more evil, at least to to think in one's heart some possible redeeming value to this person that he was at one time good, and as a result of that, pray that <coughs> that goodness and that innocence somehow be restored. Page Lamed. <laughs> <laughs>
So these are concluding uh, remarks on this section of the book. Adkan Higiu Shaloshis Midos. Until now we have discoursed upon these thirteen Midos. Shebehen Hiye Odom Doime El Koinoi, through which a person should seek to emulate his creator. Shehen Midos Shalrachamim El Yonos. And these are elevated, supernal attributes of mercy. Usguloson and their special power. Because just as a person acts below, the way in which a person interacts with the world around him and with other people in particular, so he will merit to open for himself and catalyze for himself an application of these um, midos on high. Literally according to the way in which he himself behaves. So if a person acts with any one or all of these 13 attributes of mercy, doing so practically and physically in this world with the people around him is going to result in catalyzing that type of treatment, interaction between God and himself as well. So he has influence on high. And he causes that particular attribute or number of attributes with which he's behaving, he causes their infusion into the world to become illuminated and intensified according to his own behavior. So if he acts in any one of these or all of these, 13 attributes of Rachamim, he's stirring up not only God's behavior and interaction with him this way, but he's actually tipping the scales that God should act this way with the entire world as well. His actions, in a way, reach up through the spheros back into Kesser and enable a more smooth and abundant flow of the Mida of God's divine mercy through Kesser down through the rest of the spheros back into this world. And that's going to benefit everybody, not just himself. <coughs> and therefore he causes that that attribute should become illuminated in the world. Therefore, therefore there should not be removed there should not be allowed to depart from the eyes, from one's mind's eye. These 13 attributes that we have elaborated upon. And the verse from Micha that all of these attributes are derived from should not depart from the person's mouth. Meaning they should be on his lips constantly. So that he remembers and recalls these 13 attributes. So that when there arouses some scenario um, regarding which it would be appropriate to behave in any one of these 13, he'll remember and say, Oh, this scenario justifies the application of attribute 1, or 6, or 9, or whatever the case may be. And I don't want to depart from applying this attribute. In order not to cause the termination of the expression of that mida from the supernal realm on high, to me in particular, and to the world in general, because I am not aware of or refuse to act according to any of the particular mitos, as they should be extended to any of the particular scenarios that a person might encounter. And therefore, basically what he's saying is, a person should commit this verse to memory in order to remember all of its 13 phrases and, conti- and, and consider the meaning of all of the uh, expressions of, of, uh, of, of mercy that each phrase corresponds to and live his life accordingly so that in every situation that arises in life, he can think, oh, this is a scenario where attribute X or Y or Z would be applicable, right? so, that he doesn't, um, so that he doesn't live life without applying them. And the result of that, he would be, he would be um, minimizing 
the expression of divine mercy on himself and also in the world. Okay? So these are the 13 attributes. It uh, would behoove us to remember them by heart, if possible. If one wanted to take this very seriously, he could photocopy the verse or write it down, maybe in 13 lines, with a brief summary of what each one is, and then keep it in his pocket. So he remembers, wow, this looks like a scenario where uh, the application of mercy would apply. Which one? Is it, it's an exhaustive list? It, it seems to be. Yes, 13 attributes of... Uh, 13, specifically, 13 attributes of Rachamim. And very early on, we discussed the significance of 13. Maybe there's 17, you just cover 13 of them. 13 of 17 <laughs> attributes. <laughs> no, the source is doing, he's right, it was limited to 13. Yud, Gibel, Midas, and Rachamim. And 12 and 13 are interchangeable, right? So they're, the they're, 13th is like, they're, since it encapsulates everything. Yeah, that, that's a possibility. I mean, 12 and 13 are interconnected. Although, um, like I said, uh, 12 seems to be relating to um, the shvua uh, that God made to the ancestors, which would include any of the links in the chain necessary to uh, do that um, and exclude anybody who has uh, dislinked himself. 13 would cover even those. Okay, so let's end here today and uh, completing this part of the book and... Um, Next time we meet, Bezal Hashem, we'll start the next section. Mm-hmm.